Hi everybody and welcome to this revision video on classical conditioning, key terms and variables. This is part of the psychology of learning topic for stage 2 psychology. Let's get started. So let's recap some of the main key terms that we need to know and be aware of going forward in this topic. So the neutral stimulus or NS is a stimulus that does not evoke a response at first, however, becomes a conditioned stimulus through association with the unconditioned stimulus. So in my previous two videos, I talked about the Pavlov experiment and the little Albert experiment. So the neutral stimuli in both of those experiments in terms, well, in terms of the Pavlov one was the bell because it starts off neutral at first. It did not evoke a response at first, but it became the conditioned stimulus through association. With the little Albert experiment, the white rat starts out neutral. Again, it did not evoke a response at first, but it became the conditioned stimulus again through association. So a really handy tip is to remember that the neutral stimulus and the conditioned stimulus are always the same. So the neutral becomes the conditioned stimulus. Now the unconditioned stimulus or US as it's often referred is a stimulus that elicits an unconditioned response. So what's going to naturally cause the reflex response without any association or any learning at all. So the unconditioned response or UR is a reflex or innate response. It does not require learning or conditioning. So again, the unconditioned response is caused by the unconditioned stimulus that will naturally cause a reflex response to happen. So we know that in the Pavlov experiment, food will naturally cause dogs to salivate. And in the little Albert experiment, the loud noise will cause little Albert to be frightened. So no learning's actually happened yet. It's just what's the natural reflex response and what would cause that without any intervention at all. So that's the unconditioned stimulus affecting the unconditioned response. Once the association has been made between two or more stimuli, that's when we look at these two concepts. So the conditioned stimulus, a conditioned stimulus as a previously neutral stimulus that now produces a classically conditioned or learnt response. So again, the neutral always becomes the conditioned, the NS and the CS are always the same. So this new learnt uh, response is now the conditioned response or CR. So a learnt response to a previously neutral stimulus. And what's going to cause that now is the new CS. So in a lot of scenarios, not in every single one, but often the unconditioned response and the conditioned response are the same or they're very similar. What changes is what causes them. So what now causes the conditioned stimulus, whereas it wouldn't have before or it meant nothing to the animal or the human before. So that's the process of classical conditioning and the key terms, but there's other classical conditioning concepts we need to explore in terms of what makes it more likely to happen and what strengthens or weakens classical conditioning reflexes. So classical conditioning is a complex form of learning in animals. However, there are, there are other variables that have an impact on the strength and effectiveness of the learning. So in this video, we're going to explore the following concepts. Stimulus generalization, stimulus discrimination, extinction, spontaneous recovery, contiguity, contingency, and preparedness. So it's important that we know all of these terms and all of these variables as they have the potential to impact the strength and effectiveness of classical conditioning. So what I've done before I go any further is give examples based on the Pavlov experiment and the little Albert experiment. For some of these, these did actually happen, but obviously not in all cases. It just gives you an example to apply it to, to make it a bit easier to understand the concept. Let's start with stimulus generalization. This occurs when the conditioned response is elicited on the presentation of other similar stimuli other than the original conditioned stimulus. So applying this to our two previous examples, Dexter salivating to a horn or a tone similar to the original conditioned stimulus of the bell, if it elicits the same conditioned response, then that is generalization. So in other words, the dog has generalized his response to anything that's even similar to that original bell or the conditioned stimulus. So that might be a doorbell or a horn or again, a different bell tone that's similar in nature. If it elicits the same response of salivation, so he salivates to all bell sounding noises, that shows that he has generalized his response. Now, we actually know that this did occur in the little Albert experiment. 
Not only had he become fearful of white rats, but he had become fearful of all white fluffy objects. So he was frightened of bunny rabbits. He was frightened of the mask with the cotton wool attached because they had similar characteristics to the condition stimulus of the white rat. So he elicits the same conditioned response despite separate condition stimuli. So another very good example of this is when someone may have had a phobic reaction to a spider, but then now they have generalized their response to be fearful of all insects that even resemble in some way a spider. So they've generalized their responses. This is also a very good example with food poisoning, which often fuels or starts classical conditioning responses. So if a person has KFC, for example, and it gives them food poisoning, not only can they not stand the look or the smell of KFC, but anything that's even related to it. So anything that resembles chicken, so that might include turkey or other food companies that offer chicken like Red Rooster and so on. So they've generalized their response beyond the initial condition stimulus. We've uh, classified that as generalization. Next is stimulus discrimination. So this is the opposite of generalization, what I was just talking about. So this occurs when a person or animal only responds to the original condition stimulus and not to any other stimuli that is similar to it. So examples from our previous uh, experiments. If Dexter only salivated to the sound of the hand bell or the original condition stimulus and nothing else that even was similar, that shows that he has discriminated between the stimuli and it's only the original bell that causes the salivation. He has discriminated and that illustrates this concept. Now this didn't happen, but again, just for context, if little Albert only became fearful at the sight of the white rat and not the dog or the bunny rabbit or the mask with the cotton wool on it, he was able to discriminate between other white fluffy objects. So that shows discrimination. So this only occurs when the original condition stimulus causes the response and nothing similar to it. We also need to talk about extinction. This is when there is a reduction or loss in the strength or rate of a conditioned response when the UCS is withheld. So in other words, our fear response or our conditioned response, whatever it is, goes away or it reduces, which is possible. So examples. Dexter's conditioned response of salivating to the bell could eventually cease if not continuously paired with the UCS. So eventually he would learn that he's not going to get food when the bell is rung. So eventually his conditioned response will become extinct or it'll wear off. Same with Little Albert. Little Albert's conditioned response of fear could eventually cease um, if the unconditioned stimulus of the loud noise is not paired with the white rat. Eventually he would learn that the white rat is not going to cause the noise and there is no need for alarm. So our conditioned responses can reduce with time or go away completely and that is known as extinction. But just like they can go away, they can also come back and this is what we refer to as a spontaneous recovery. So this is the reappearance after a rest period of an extinguished conditioned response. It's important to note here that spontaneous recovery can only occur after an extinguished response. So again, to put it in context, if Dexter is presented with pairing of the food and the bell again after extinction, he is going to make a spontaneous recovery of his original conditioned response. So what that means is that if we pair the food and the bell again, he will quickly or spontaneously recover and his conditioned response of salivating to the bell will quickly come back. Same with Little Albert. If Little Albert was presented with the pairing of the white, no uh, white rat sorry, and the loud noise together, his conditioned response of fear will make a spontaneous recovery or quickly come back. Now with spontaneous recovery, it's often the case that the recovery of the conditioned response the second time is not as strong as the original time. However, there are exceptions. It can be just as bad or if not worse or stronger, but a lot of the time it's not as strong. We also need to be aware of contiguity with classical conditioning. This refers to the time interval between the UCS and the CS pairing. So classical conditioning is most effective when the time interval is small. Where possible, half a second. 
If it's any longer than this, or the longer the association is left, the association between the stimuli won't be strong enough to elicit a strong conditioned response. So again, if the food was presented to Dexter one hour after the bell was rung, the dog is not likely to have made an association between the two stimuli. So it needs to happen as close as possible. So that's why Pavlov presented the food immediately or half a second after ringing the bell. Same thing with little Albert. If the loud noise occurred one hour after presenting Albert with the white rat, he would obviously not make an association or the association would not be as strong. So for classical conditioning to be successful, the time interval between the UCS and the CS needs to be small. We also need to talk about contingency. This refers to the predictability of occurrence of one stimulus from the presence of another. So in order, in order for a strong condition response to occur, the condition stimulus needs to remain predictable and consistent. Again, examples. In Pavlov's experiment, if Dexter received a different noise each time he was presented with food during the initial conditioning process, the condition response is not as likely to occur, or if it does, it's not going to be as strong. Same with Little Albert. If Little Albert heard different noises of different volumes during the conditioning process, the condition response is not as likely to occur as strongly. So think of contingency as consistency. If we keep the conditioned stimulus, conditioned response, and the unconditioned stimulus the same, then obviously classical conditioning is more likely to be successful. In terms of phases of classical conditioning, let's go through this quickly. The acquisition phase is the process during the conditioning of pairing the unconditioned stimulus with the conditioned stimulus. So in other words, the acquiring of a CR. Examples, the pairing of the food with the bell during the conditioning process eliciting salivation from Dexter in Pavlov's experiment was the acquisition phase. The pairing of the white rat with the loud noise during the conditioning process in Watson's experiment with Little Albert eliciting fear and crying from the child was the acquisition phase. So the process of acquiring a CR by pairing the US and the NS together. The performance phase is what occurs afterwards. So this is when the conditioned response or CR is elicited without the unconditioned stimulus needing to be present. So the performing of the conditioned response. So when Dexter inevitably salivated to the sound of the bell only without the food being present, that is the performance phase. When Albert was scared or started crying to the white rat without the loud noise having to be made, that is the performance phase. It's also important to consider preparedness. Preparedness occurs when conditioned responses are learned more rapidly and easily than others. Preparedness actually doesn't apply to the Pavlov or Little Albert experiment because it took several times or several trials between, or several pairings I should say, between the US and the NS. But sometimes it can only take one pairing or one trial. We refer to this as preparedness because it only takes one time for an association to be made and we are classically conditioned. In general, classical conditioning occurs over a period of time as we've seen with the Pavlov and Albert experiments and requires several pairings. However, there are some instances when conditioning can occur just after one time or very, very rapidly. This often relates to our survival instincts regarding phobias. This is why phobias such as spiders, snakes and heights are more common. They're more easily learned due to the compromise in survival. In my next video, I'm going to go through fears and phobias and classical conditioning. It's completely rational to have a fear of spiders and snakes and heights because obviously they can compromise our well-being and of course our survival in the right circumstances. So often we develop fears or we're classically conditioned to these things because there is a direct threat to life. And it only takes one pairing or one incident, in other words, of a height or a snake or a spider to cause us to be very fearful or phobic of these stimuli. This also relates to evolutionary history. Organisms that learn to fear environmental threats faster had a survival and reproductive advantage. This also explains why taste aversions relating to classical conditioning are learned so easily. We learn that certain foods will cause danger to survival, 
Anyone that's had food poisoning will know what I mean. It's very unlikely that you will continue to eat the food that gave you food poisoning without having to be conditioned first. So if a person is violently ill because of KFC, for example, it's not very likely that they're going to quickly go back and eat KFC after going through severe food poisoning, which is an example of classical conditioning. So a person may eat KFC once and then never eat it again. They don't need several times or several trials or pairings of eating KFC to then feel nauseous on the sight or the sound of KFC. This relates to preparedness as well.